starting off his life of wild capers and thievery at age seven, Colton Harris Moore was a child, then preteen, then teenage bandit. He is allegedly responsible for about a hundred thefts throughout his teenage years in a story that involves hiding in the forest, committing crimes without shoes on, teaching oneself to fly airplanes, and stealing a couple of planes. Add an extradition, the FBI, and quite the wild goose chase. Just the recipe we need for another Capers and Cocktails. Welcome to Capers and Cocktails, true crime that doesn't take itself too seriously and obviously gives you something to enjoy while you listen. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you're enjoying one of our themed cocktails, ensure you're of legal drinking age and have fun, but drink responsibly. The most popular origin story of the Shirley Temple, arguably the first mocktail, is one that for some reason I like grew up knowing or like the basics of. Did you? Supposedly, this refreshing non-alcoholic treat was whipped up by the staff at Chasen's Restaurant in Hollywood, California, especially for 10-year-old birthday girl Shirley Temple, a sweet little movie star who was underage and couldn't enjoy a cocktail with her parents. They evidently wanted to make her something special. Wherever it was first made, it would become pretty solidly Shirley's. In 1988, a soda company named Soda Pop Kids released a bottled version of the Shirley Temple, and Shirley actually filed a lawsuit against them, saying the use of her name was an invasion of privacy. At the time, she told the New York Times, quote, I will fight it like a tigress, end quote. She won. As it turns out, Shirley Temple did not even like the drink that was her namesake, At an appearance in October 1998, Shirley's friend handed her a Shirley Temple, complete with a cocktail umbrella. She pushed the glass aside and said, quote, if you drink that, you're going to get diabetes, end quote. She seems fun. All right, let's get started. The original Shirley Temple was made with ginger ale, but I think that's gross. So we're making ours with the far more appropriate lemon lime soda. Sprite. Okay, for the dirty Shirley, we'll have... Cherry vodka, grenadine, lemon lime soda, lime juice for extra punch, and a maraschino cherry for garnish. Remember, buy those good ones. For the mocktail, we just eliminate the vodka. So for our cocktail, we'll take two parts cherry vodka, one part grenadine, and a half a part lime juice and put that into our shaker. We'll shake it vigorously and strain over fresh ice. We add to that four parts of lemon lime soda and that beautiful maraschino cherry for garnish. For the mocktail, we're just going to mix this directly into the glass, eight parts lemon lime soda, one part grenadine, and a half a part lime juice. Stir it up and add a maraschino cherry or five for a garnish. Now on to today's capers, committed by someone who was only legal enough to drink the Shirley Temple when he committed his sprees. Colton Harris Moore was born on March 22, 1991, in Mount Vernon, Washington, that's Washington State, to mom Pamela and dad Gordon. Colton did not have the best upbringing, growing up in his mom's trailer on Kamano Island, Washington. Over the course of his childhood, neighbors made several calls to Child Protective Services, alleging neglect and probably abuse. Colton would later say his mother was a drinker, and after she drank, she would become mean and break his toys. Gordon was a drug user and went to prison when Colton was a toddler. Evidently, when Colton was 12, Gordon, who had recently been released from prison, walked into the woods after a family barbecue and was not heard from again. He was subsequently arrested, so that's probably why they didn't hear from him. Pamela would later say that by the time Colton was seven, she knew there was, quote, something off about him, end quote. She struggled even then to parent him. He started fights at school, wouldn't listen to his teachers, and broke things at his house. Sounds like he learned that from his mom. And then Colton started living in the wild. As a seven-year-old, he would break into vacation homes on the island to steal water, food, and blankets. He would then disappear into the woods for days. He would be diagnosed with attention deficit disorder, depression, and intermittent explosive disorder. His lawyer would later speculate that he was also autistic. Pretty quickly, authorities caught on to his thievery. He was first convicted for stealing property at age 12 when police found a neighbor's camcorder in his house. He had four convictions within a few months of turning 13. 
Often, these convictions came with short stays in detention centers and community service. He continued to get into trouble but was never sentenced to detention for any longer than a month until he was 17. Then he fled a three-year sentence by walking out of the Griffin Home Residential Treatment Center on April 29, 2008. He quickly stole a car and returned to Kamano Island. It sort of appears that for the most part, at the beginning of his career, Colton really just stole small things he needed to live in the woods. He was a survivalist, a survivalist that liked some of the finer things. He would often slip into a home just to take a hot bath or steal some ice cream from the freezer. He once allegedly used the computer and a credit card from a home he broke into to order bear mace and a pair of $6,500 night vision goggles. Pretty expensive goggles, I gotta say. Oh, and how did he get these stolen items he would order? Well, he'd have them shipped to the house that he ordered them from, and then he would break back into the house once they were delivered and pick them up. Local authorities at this point were getting fed up with Colton and started working a bit harder to capture him. He also started gaining some notoriety in the press. News stories started running about a mysterious teenage fugitive. On July 18th, 2008, sheriff's deputies on Kamano Island engaged in a car chase with an erratically driven black Mercedes. In the car, they found a variety of stolen items, including cell phones, credit cards, and a digital camera that had some self-portraits of Colton, who was quickly identified. A bit of an anti-hero at this point, similar to the geezer bandit, he began to garner some fans. Eventually, he would become an internet sensation, with a Facebook page of his own garnering around 60,000 followers. You can also buy shirts for Colton, including my personal favorite, spoiler alert, Colton stole my heart and my plane. One of his nicknames with his fan base was the Barefoot Bandit, because reportedly he committed some of his crimes barefoot. Officials say that he more often wore shoes, so I'm going to stick with the Teenage Bandit. I love a good throwback, you know? The last week's upload, geezer, teenage, never mind. In August 2008, Colton determined that Kamado Island was getting a little small for him to hide in, woods or no woods, so he moved on to Orcas Island. Orcas Island was similar in population, but almost double in square miles. More woods, more wild living for Colton. So he stole a boat and traveled the 38 miles to his new, albeit temporary, home island. It wasn't long before San Juan County officials began hearing about the uptick in burglaries and correctly suspected that it was Colton. Colton then correctly estimated it was time to leave. (laughs) At this point, things are going to escalate for uh, old Colton. Young Colton. Yeah, Yeah, you get it. He had been reading some aircraft manuals and handbooks. Then he got his hands on a DVD called How to Fly a Small Airplane that he eagerly watched. And he started playing a Microsoft flight simulator. I'm going to guess that Colton was a pretty smart kid because that was enough for him to be well-versed enough to fly small aircraft. Eh, Not always that well, but he could fly them. It's more than I can do. (laughs) I'm guessing that you can tell that Colton didn't own any small aircraft. Thus began a series of airplane thefts. On November 12th, 2008, at age 17, he stole a Cessna 182 from an airplane hangar. Remember, his flight experience came from a computer game. This plane was owned by the radio personality Bob Rivers and valued at over $150,000. He flew the plane 300 miles east and crash-landed the plane on the Yakima Indian Reservation in eastern Washington. He managed to escape before authorities arrived. For a few months, he was on the run along the western seaboard before returning to Kamano Island in April 2009. Guess there's no place like home, huh? At this point, Colton was 18 and had to be a bit more careful since now his adult exploits would come with some serious adult consequences. And in fact, he had tons of charges in various counties that he was avoiding consequences for, including illegal flight to avoid prosecution and identity theft. But somehow, Colton always managed to stay one step ahead of authorities. In one incident, he actually broke into a police car, stealing police-issued equipment, including a rifle, ammunition, and a cell phone. In another incident, as he was being pursued by police, Colton purposely crashed a stolen car into a gas storage tank, causing a huge explosion. This diversion allowed him to escape in the woods. One sheriff said, quote, We saw him, we think, but it's like he vanished in front of our eyes, end quote. 
Another time, sheriff's deputies were waiting for him at a house that he had previously burglarized. Probably he ordered some stuff to be delivered there. Colton re-entered the home using a key he had stolen. And when police tried to grab him, Colton sprayed them with pepper spray and sprinted out the door. I I mean, I got to say this kid's pretty good. At this point, it just seems like he was doing all of this for fun. He engaged in a slew of burglaries across Washington, Idaho, and Southwest Canada. And he did not limit himself to ice cream and hot baths. He stole tons of property, bicycles, automobiles, and speedboats. Colton stole his second airplane from the San Juan Island Public Airport on September 11, 2009, and landed it on Orcas Island's public airport runway. Two weeks later, he stole his second Cessna 182 and his third airplane, flying 260 miles to the west from Bonners Ferry, Idaho. He ran out of fuel and crash-landed at the plane near Granite Falls, Washington, where authorities found a very familiar set of footprints. When his mother was interviewed about Colton's theft of this plane, she told reporters, quote, I'm proud of him. I was going to send him to flight school, but I guess I don't have to, end quote. Okay. In another interview, Pam would be quoted as saying, quote, I hope to hell he stole those airplanes. I would be so proud, but I want him to wear a parachute next time, end quote. Nothing like a proud mom, eh? More warrants were issued for Colton's arrest, including a federal arrest warrant. That's what you get for stealing airplanes and flying them across state lines, I suppose. It did not deter him, and he stole and flew another airplane from island to island. Wanting that barefoot bandit nicknamed a stick, on February 11, 2010, he stole some sidewalk chalk and drew cartoon feet up and down the aisle of an Orcas Island grocery store, homegrown grocery, and wrote, see ya, at the end of the footprints. He nabbed over $1,000 from the cash register and headed out. Very mature 19-year-old, I must say. At this point, local law enforcement was realizing that this was a bit out of their league. They called in the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, and the Coast Guard. Quickly, the FBI offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to Colton's arrest. I don't know why, but this is like my favorite part of this story. On May 30th, 2010, police found a handwritten note and $100 at a veterinary clinic in Raymond, Washington. The note read, quote, drove by, had some extra cash. Please use this money for the care of the animals. Colton Harris Moore, a.k.a. the Barefoot Bandit, Kamano Island, Washington. End quote. Uh, that's kind of cute. And then Colton really skipped town. He headed east, stealing cars and planes and driving and flying as far as Illinois. Colton, still 19 years old, decided he would like to head to someplace a bit warmer and a bit, well, not the United States. On July 4th, 2010, a Cessna 400 single engine plane was stolen from the Bloomington, Indiana airport. Colton strikes again. He flew the plane for 1,188 miles before he was forced to crash land the plane in the waters of the shoreline of the great Abaco Island in the Bahamas. By this point, Colton has a bit of an M.O., so authorities immediately speculated that despite the distance, they knew their culprit. For a few days, Colton started to do what he did best, making his way to a nearby fishing village and stealing food from some stores and restaurants. Seven days after he crash-landed the plane, on July 11, 2010, Colton was captured just before dawn at Harbor Island, Bahamas. After a series of tips came in from local Bahamians, authorities closed in on the teenage bandit after he stole yet another speedboat and ran it aground onto a sandbar and got stuck. He attempted to flee, but police shot the engine on the boat. Before being arrested, Colton threw his laptop into the water and put a gun to his head but police managed to talk him out of killing himself. He would tell authorities that his plan had been to flee to Cuba and then to the Turks and Caicos Islands. His mother would later say that she had hoped he would flee to a country without an extradition treaty treaty with the United States. Ever the supportive mother, it seems. The $10,000 reward money was split among the five people who were directly involved in capturing Colton Harris Moore. Colton would plead guilty to every charge that came his way. This included bank burglary, interstate transportation of a stolen aircraft, being a fugitive in possession of a firearm, piloting an aircraft without a valid airman certificate, and interstate transportation of a stolen vessel. I mean, he committed so many crimes, he probably doesn't even remember them all. So it's probably wise to just go with what the authorities say at that point. He was sentenced to seven years in state prison, 
six years by the Island County Court, and six additional years in federal prison. At sentencing, U.S. District Judge Richard A. Jones said that Colton had endangered others with his reckless conduct. That's probably an understatement. He would also tell Colton that it was time for a new life flight plan. That punny guy is a man after my heart. His prison sentences were consolidated to six total years, and he was transferred to the Stafford Creek Correction Center in Aberdeen, Washington, to begin serving his sentence. In April 2010, shortly before beginning his prison sentence, 20th Century Fox bought the movie rights to a book proposal. The book will be called, it hasn't been written yet, but the title is The Barefoot Bandit, The True Tale of Colton Harris Moore, New American Outlaw by Bob Friel. Now, that is a movie I would pay to watch if they ever made it, and I guess pay to read if he ever writes it. Evidently, because of the terms of his plea deal, he can't actually get any of that money or any money related to selling publishing rights to his story. So that goes to his victims in the form of restitution. The amount he was ordered to repay? $1.4 million. That is a lot of gallons of ice cream. In December 2015, Colton began writing a blog from prison to, according to him, break his long-standing silence and throw his hat in the ring to support then-presidential candidate Donald Trump. The blog was taken down. In 2016, his mom was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer, and Colton set up a GoFundMe with a goal of $230,000 in order to, and I'm sorry but you can't make this up, have his mother's body cryogenically frozen at the time of her death so that she could potentially later be revived and cured. When she died in May of 2016, he'd only managed to raise a little over $2,000, so that money was returned to the donors. Colton was released on probation in July 2016 at the near geriatric age of 25. He moved into a halfway house and took a part-time job answering phones and doing clerical work with John Henry Brown, the Seattle attorney who had represented him in court. In December of that year, he started another GoFundMe, aiming to raise over $100,000 for... Any ideas? Flight school. He would write, quote, Now I am 25 years old, free, and ready to do it legally. I love airplanes, but I will never steal one or break the law again. I broke the law big league when I was younger, but now it's time to focus on my career and life in the free world, end quote. His parole officer told them that was a no-go, and the $1,600 he managed to raise went towards his restitution. Colton was interviewed for a radio station in 2019 where he would reminisce fondly about his first plane flight as a 17-year-old. Precocious. Yeah, that's one word. He would say, quote, it's this uncontrollable obsession. That's really what it is. It's something that you have dreamt about and waited for your entire life. I wonder if I'll ever feel that again. It's one of those moments that I think you only get once or twice in your entire life, end quote. Colton Harris Moore completed his probation and then removed any trace of himself on social media and is living life as a 21st century recluse. I mean, that just means he's not online. Radio personality Bob Rivers' Cessna 182 was recovered from the crash site, badly damaged. It was rebuilt and currently lives in Florida. Thanks for hanging out with me. Colton Harris Moore might have taken some lessons from last week's Geezer Bandit, as it turns out. Older and wiser, I suppose. Oof. Next week, we have a short upload about a man who made some bad choices because of a former employer. A pizza dough factory. To go with that Italian fare, we have an Italian Negroni to drink. I must say, the Italians have some expensive taste in liquor. If you're not scared by that, the ingredients for the drink are in the description box. And I'll tell you right now, the mocktail is a completely different drink. It's good, but it's not a Negroni. In fact, we're calling it a no-groni. Whether you make the drink or not, whether you're a cocktail or a mocktail fan, I hope you're hitting like and subscribe. Check out the social medias if you want. I'll see you next week. And remember, there are always alternatives to stealing hundreds and thousands of dollars worth of property when you should be hanging out at the mall or playing on your Xbox.